This is Luke Gygax. Do you believe that the mechanics of combat are not the key to heroic fantasy and adventure games? Well, you're in the right place. Welcome to Save or Die. You burst through the door, you find a small room filled with golden jewels. Like a red dragon, he starts to breathe. Save or die! The Save or Die Podcast, a podcast about classic Dungeons and Dragons. Bring on your goblin holes and band of oaks, hulking zombies and bows, and on your little troll, don't slow me down, no, oh, no. Episode 82, Save or Die, 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 Die. Maybe I should echo the save a bit more, because that's kind of, I don't know. Mm, yeah, Morbid. it's not. I can As fix usual. that in post. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if you can, why not? Yeah, give Mike the big voice. Origins! <laughs> Great day to you, As usual, DM Mike here with DM Jim. Greetings, programs. And by po- back by popular demand, DM Liz. Yay! <laughs> A lot of people were, were grumpy grousing about you not talking much in the last show so we need to fix that I- including me <laughs> <laughs> it's true true I'll, story i'll try to do better next or yeah next time i'll try to do better <laughs> this time this is next time <laughs> well i'll be reading all the emails again so oh, yeah, that's, yes. not, that's not the same though we need to get you some uh, kind uh, of yeah. internet powered cattle prod for when the three of us get hosed into decks with testosterone too much yeah Throw on an occasional "Your ignorance appalls me," or something. <laughs> you know that that would work. Yes, yeah, so I'll try to channel my inner Doctor Science. There you go. Uh, but the one Remember. thing you did say last show that I, I, I this uh, week I saw uh, the army is testing this robot, this four-legged robot, and they finally had an untethered test, and it can only get with all the batteries weighted down. It can only get up to sixteen miles an hour. But it was trippy. It was your horse you were talking about. Ooh, so ooh. one sci-fi thing you'd put in your game. Here's this four-legged thing just hauling ass down the road. Was, it was was that looking. the mule? I don't. I don't even remember what they call, but it's a it's a military contract thing, and it's spooky to see this thing galloping down the road. Yeah, I heard of it. I heard of something called the mule, which was basically supposed to work as kind of a battle buddy with a living soldier, carry extra ammo, supplies. And, oh yeah, yeah, that's know, it. That's it. And, and go into dangerous positions to be kind of forward observer, so the soldier doesn't risk himself. Yeah, those are. I just read a book called Wired for War, and. It had some really incredible – I mean they're talking – he was talking about stuff they're doing right now that I swear sounded like science fiction. It really did, whether it's the drones or combat robots or whatever, so even Liz, cybernetics. I, I think of you when I see things online besides bad logos. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> hey, a bad logo. Man, that reminds me of Liz. It's like, what? <laughs> no, that's not what I meant. She makes horrid logos. <laughs> I'd recognize that logoing anywhere. It's Liz. <laughs> nah, nah. Well, as the logo for the show, speaking of logos, should reveal, this is going to be an email-only episode. I know, I know. Many of you would have thought, well, wasn't that the last episode? <laughs> <laughs> you are forgiven for thinking that. But after this email... After this show, we will be completely and totally caught up on our emails, and we'll try not to spend half the show talking emails. Your emails and messages are very important to us, but we shouldn't make it most of a show unless we put at the head of it, this is an email show, so we'll know what to expect. (laughs) We probably need to Actually, we will not be totally caught up on our emails, because I posted on my personal Facebook page that we were going to be doing an email show. And one of our listeners responded saying, I just now sent you an email. Thanks, like, Kojo. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no, it was Montana. Oh, Hi, okay. Montana. <laughs> the Invisible Fist. So, 
he has ensured that no matter what, we are not going to be caught up on our emails when we finish this show. Like we, Sisyphus. <laughs> we probably. Oh, oh, well. Nice reference, sir. Nice reference. <laughs> Dan, I could do it because Glenn's not here. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I guess that wasn't in a movie I can think of off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah well, wasn't that in Clash of Titans? Nah, anyway. <laughs> Unfortunately, Glenn will not be with us because he is doing his final dress rehearsal for the Christmas Carol play that he is starring in as Scrooge. I'm I'm so bugged. Glenn has to do real work and he can't be with us online today. Dun, dun, dun. Well, he cannot come out and play. How are we going to do the division of labor then? Who gets to be grumpy and who gets to say inappropriate things occasionally? Um, well, I'll let's say drop... penguin. Which yeah. one? I'll say penguin. Yeah, that. And you can insert whatever thing. you can insert whatever inappropriate comment you like into that space, and just using penguin as a placeholder, and so. Listeners will be able to choose whatever inappropriate commentary they would like to insert. Oh, what so do you like, think Liz said? It's time for the penguin on your Pathfinder collection to explode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you deserved it, you penguiny penguin. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying to you? Penguin! penguin. <laughs> exactly. And this is All a potty right. mouth episode. <laughs> well, penguiny anyway. <laughs> But before we start on the pile of emails, what have you been doing this week the, since the last show, Game Wise, Jim? Hey, um, we had a uh, fist session in my game system that I'm writing that's based on Dungeon Crawl Classics. And uh, uh, in reference to what the last show was about, I uh, took the uh, I walked the walk and talked the talk. So I'm running. Mutant Crawl Classics RPG using Dungeon Crawl Classics RPG rules in a Labyrinth Lord Stonehell module by Michael Curtis that's about mutants coming into Stonehell and converting everything on the fly in my head. So we had had a great game. Was that inspired by the Great Stonehell Laser Massacre from... Uh, That's what I'm running them in. They got to the end of the module I wrote, uh, went to a portal, and bam down into the bowels of Stonehell. And God love them, they didn't even know they were fighting an Iron Golem until about (laughs) two-thirds of the way through the battle. (laughs) The poor mutant with pyrokinesis actually healed the Iron Golem for me, which I thank him for. Ooh. (laughs) And the Iron Golem thanked him, too, with 10 to 20 damage. But, you know, we're just trying to kick the tires as hard as I know how on the system I'm writing, and uh, it was a lot of fun. I've, it, I, it's a very interesting study in terms of what we talk about on this show and the whole old-school uh, style and sensibility of play, because it's this is the fifth session, and that has been enough sessions now where my entire group, from Micah, who's 9, to Kevin, who's 47, and uh, all the people that regularly play Pathfinder have now collected together under the old school umbrella and they're playing smart and cautious all the time now they are there every time they go into a room their first thought is how is jim about to kill us and i love it <laughs> gotta know when to hold them no one to fold them no one to walk away no one to run and and and, and, and i and i tried and last game i only got one of them so <laughs> two, two and nine times out of ten knowing when to run is usually what you need to be doing <laughs> <laughs> So that's what I've been doing. And I'm looking forward to our second session of that Judges Guild module, the Dwarven Glory Hole. Woohoo! Yeah, yeah. That should be coming up hopefully this next Tuesday. Knock on wood. Would have been last Tuesday, but Liz got uh, inducted into an honors fraternity. That yes, a secret Tuesday. society. Well, it's not really a secret society. Secret except for the 500 people that were there. Eh. <laughs> so are you a time lady now? Uh, no, I'm not a time lady, and I'm not a member of the Illuminati or anything really cool like that. It's she was just, really looking forward to one of those collars. I was. <laughs> yeah. Time Lord collars, those are great. Oh, you can yeah. rock one of those. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I was inducted into the local chapter of a National Honor Society, which is specifically for older students, or what they refer to as non-traditional students, who are returning back to college and basically juggling school, um, family life, work, yada, yada, yada. Podcasts. 
yeah, well, podcasts weren't mentioned, but I'm sure that they were implied. <laughs> So I did that Tuesday evening, and my parents came down to see it happen, and then we all went out to dinner afterwards, and it was a lot of fun. That is a legitimate excuse, ma'am. Yes. You may now all refer to me as Miss Smarty Pants. <laughs> Mrs. Clever? <laughs> I'm Mrs. Gratuitous Doctor Clever. Who reference. <laughs> so did you get any gaming in, Miss Smarty Pants? Uh, I did. I went to our second edition game yesterday, and Mike was not feeling well, so I went by myself this time, and I ran his character for him. Unfortunately, he did not get XP for it because he was not there, but did do that. We fought lots of vampires, a big flock of gargoyles, our mage, Jonathan, fireballed the whole flock of them as they were coming down toward us and killed every single one of them except for one, which then spectacularly failed its morale check and just went flying off to the nearest mountain range. So that was a pretty cool scene in the game there. Screw uh, you guys, I'm going home. That's right. He's like, ah, I don't get paid enough for this. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so... Did our usual game. Mike was not there. What level are you I, guys? Because vampires suck. They're hard. Uh, they are hard. Um, sixth or seventh now. Yeah, we're all between sixth and seventh level. Um, I'm playing a seventh level cleric of Lathander, which means, fortunately for all of us, because I'm a, a worshiper of Lathander, I get to turn at four levels higher than I actually am. Oh, that so, makes a difference. Yes, it does. <laughs> and even so, I still did a couple of really bad rolls yesterday and failed to turn a couple of vampires. And they had to be really bad. At my level, turning it four levels higher, I only needed a 10. And there were a couple of times I'd roll. It was like three. It's like, crap. <laughs> well, you're bound to choke once in a while when there's a lot at stake. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. and, uh -huh. and, at stake. And, and 10 is 50%, you know, yeah. on a D20. <laughs> but we managed to muddle through regardless. We still have not run into the big vampire that we actually came to this old crypt to encounter. We've just been running into minions. So, But that was pretty much our, our game yesterday. Well, here's my two cents of advice. Have the mage load up with Dimension Door and try and find that big bad guy sometime in the daylight and just have him Dimension Door a shaft outside. <laughs> we don't have Dimension Door. <laughs> Which yeah. is unfortunate. Yeah. yeah. There, there um, was a perfectly good plan. I know. Yeah. We had been using um, our two clerics. I'm playing one, and one of the other girls in the group is playing, well, I guess she's technically a druid. But both of us have the ability to stone shape, and we had been using stone shape to just, you know, make openings in the walls to just barrel right on through. Um, that does take a lot out of us, though, so we've been having to stop and rest quite a lot. But yeah, Dimension Door would be just perfect for this, <laughs> or even a good knock spell. <laughs> However, our DM makes it very difficult for the mages to find spells. So, both Mike's character and the mage Jonathan, played by our friend Tim in the group, um, they're, they're both a bit light in their spell books on things that they really ought to be having. Got Fireball and Lightning Bolt, though. Yeah, Fireball, Lightning Bolt, Magic Missile. Yeah. The, the good old standbys, at least. So what you need to do is run into an NPC magic user, get him in the party long enough for you guys to trade spells, and then kill him. <laughs> or mug him, run out the gate, and take his spell book. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My elf's still looking for an NPC elf she can mug and get the elven chain off of. <laughs> <laughs> or at least an elven cloak. I mean, really. Something. <laughs> mm. Ah, well. Okay. Anything else, Liz? Mm, um... Well, the game that Angry Monk has been running for us, um, although I don't, we didn't do that this past week, so that didn't really... No, but it was, I think we did it between episodes last, 81 last and episode, this one. Yeah. yeah. 
So like Jim mentioned, we'd been going through the Judges Guild module, Glory Hole Dungeon, or Glory Hole Dwarven Mine, whatever it's called. <laughs> That's it, Glory Hole Dwarven Mine. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm playing a cleric in that one, too. I'm a, I'm a worshiper of the goddess Athena in this one, and we only just got to the dungeon by the end of the last game session and had started going down into it. Um, there's a whole bunch of NPCs that none of us are, trust. That none of us trust, <laughs> but they're probably all actually legit and we're overthinking it, which would be utterly hilarious. But we're all just kind of like, nee, nee. <laughs> well, I mean, after my Mac user established his authority, I now trust them. I think they're. I think they. I think they trust us because they have to. Yeah, and they were very impressed with with your demonstration of first level magic. I know. Well, right? that, that's kind of what worried me. <laughs> it's, it's like, like sleep's a first level spell, and you guys were impressed by that. How capable can you be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're oh, all well. like trying to puff themselves up, and they're all actually, you know, maybe first level characters. <laughs> Zero and first, yeah. No, no, we've been doing this before. We know what we're doing. Don't mess with us. We're dangerous. <laughs> we need a spell, Comprehend Statistics. <laughs> you cast it on an NPC and you automatically get to look at their character sheet. <laughs> well, we've played with Shannon in a while. The way he's running those guys, I'd guess I'm out five, six, something like that. that yeah. Would, that would be my guess. And we're 10th, so I'm not too worried. And we're 10, so yeah. It's we're the heavier guns, but yeah, they're, they're probably not one-hit wonders. Okay, well. Um, so what about you, Mike? I don't know. Then since I didn't make the game yesterday, uh, I'm playing a fighter in the Judges Guild Dwarven Mine, as you heard. Jim was running a magic user, so <laughs> you haven't gotten to hit anything yet. <laughs> <laughs> you were able to sleep four goblins. Yeah, well, going, you know, oh, well, you know, hey. the only thing about that is, I, in hindsight, I wished I had just uh, inducted them as like pack bearers or something instead of letting <laughs> them go. That, that, I, I think in the old days, that's probably what I would have tried to do. But we were all like on our toes to play, you know, really good and right. And... Yeah, where there's a whip, <laughs> there is a way. We let the goblins go. We did. We did. We didn't even steal their silver. <laughs> we were just super lawful. That and we're 10th level. It's like, what are you guys going to do? Go. Go away. <laughs> it's more annoying to carry this this block of silver than it's really worth financially. <laughs> Besides, we've got to save room in our packs for the really cool stuff that we are no doubt going to find when we get That's further right. in. Well, I know you guys must be doing something right in your 2E game because you've got – uh, fellow players writing in to correct you, which just happened. To I know. Me. It just happened to me on Spellburn. One of my players wrote the show to tell his side of a story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think Tim's just just been annoyed that Mead's been getting all of the airtime as we talk about what her character's done. It's like it's like okay, fine. <laughs> Maybe I need to start making trouble so you'll talk about me. <laughs> Well, a few he knows. fireballed the crap out of a bunch of gargoyles. So there. Quite true. All right. Well, let's start getting into the emails. But before we do, this is a new section we're adding called Crap, crap We've, we've forgotten, forgotten Before. before. Oh, which Mainly I was supposed to, supposed to remind you and I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I, re I just reminded you so you can remind me now. Well, see, that was Jim's crap that he forgot to mention. There you go. Yeah, which that's now mine. Gets at, which now gets added into the segment. <laughs> and we'll start with Liz. Um, okay. Well, uh, a few weeks ago, we had received an email from the people who are running AetherCon, um, which is an online role-playing convention that's going to be happening this coming weekend, hopefully by the time this actually gets put on the air, um, of November 15th through the 17th. And we had really intended on trying to maybe get them to come on and, you know, give a little plug for the convention, but we either forgot to do it or things got in the way and we never contacted them back. But we had really wanted to do it because it sounded like something that's right up our alley and 
looking at their website, there's a lot of people that we know and a lot of games, old school, that we like to play that are being represented in the con. So in lieu of that, I'm just going to mention here, AetherCon, it's an online RPG convention. Not only are there games that you can play online, but there are panels and discussions that you can log into and listen to from your computer as well. Um, it is free to attend. It's totally nonprofit. Um, there's, like I said, there's going to be tabletop RPGs. There's going to be panels. Um, there's going to be some tournaments. However, at this late date, I don't know if there are still openings for the tournaments that go through the entire weekend. Um, you'd have to get online and check that out. Um, all of the games are going to be run on the Roll20. Um, it's a browser-based virtual tabletop. Um, all you have to do is download and install the software, assuming you don't already have it on your computer from doing other stuff, and you can participate in any of the games that are going on in the convention. So, anyway, AetherCon has its own Facebook page if you want to look them up there, and you can also find them you know, online at www.aetherCon.com. A E T H E R C O N dot com slash A the number two and slash. And we'll try and have those links up on our page when the show goes up as well. It sounds like it's going to be super fun and it's free. So you have no excuse. Go check it out. Yes, ma'am. That's right. I wonder if they stream the games if you're not playing in it, if you could maybe just. Well, if it's on roll 20, probably not. Oh, well. <laughs> so that's cool. Again, sorry to the Ethernet guys or EtherCon guys. We didn't get you on the show. Maybe we can get you on for next year. We, we have docked ourselves one week's pay for this mistake. Right. <laughs> that's right. As a sign of contrition. And have dropped one level in experience. Oh. Oh. Yeah, I'm multi-class, so it's even wor- worse on me. So anything else? Uh, that's all I have. What do you have? Well, this is something that's probably not new to the classic D&D community, and I meant to mention it way back in episode 80, but didn't get a chance. So, I wanted to just let people know that there is a new fanzine out for Mistara fans called Threshold. And I have not taking a look at the issue yet but it's up for free and we will have the link in the show notes for it uh take a look if you're a fan of mistara it's probably going to be just what you're looking for and the other thing i wanted to mention is that xenopus at his blog at the xenopus archives has been covering probably he's past the series now but you can look back in the October or even early November posts where he was giving a a detailed review of a campaign world called the Manual of Arania, which dates back to 1977 for D&D. Wow. Yeah. And he he has approval from the guy who originally published it to post some of the information and discuss it, new classes, new campaign setting, etc. And he goes over it with some pretty good detail. And if you're original or Holmes D&D person, you should be reading Xenopus's archive anyway because he's yes. chock full of good stuff. And I think that's all I've forgotten, unless I've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess without further ado, let's go to the emails. Okie dokie. Well, our first email is from one of our fellow 2 e gamers, Tim Schneck. Hi, Tim. (laughs) And Tim has to say, Okay, first let me say I have to offer somewhat of a protest. Jonathan has gotten like zero mention when you discuss the 2E game. I guess I have to be honest and say there was a slight mention an episode or two back. Guess I'm going to have to start blowing up any gnomes we come across so I can get equal airtime with Mead. 
Or female pirates. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Seriously, though, over the last few months, I have worked my way through all of the Save or Die podcasts and the last half of the Thaco's Hammer podcasts. So I am current on both podcasts now. I do have to say that listening to all of the shows back-to-back on my hour commute each morning does allow one to see the show evolve over time, and I do have to say it has improved with time, and the last 25 to 30 episodes are the best you have done. So keep up the good work. The listening on my commute does bring up the comment I was going to bring up. You guys mention all sorts of various websites and games in the show, and I know they get added to the show notes on the site, but us lazy people forget which episode a particular link is mentioned on by the time we next get in front of the computer and have a chance to visit the site. And it would be nice if there was a section on the website that was just a collection of web links and such. This would also be a thing that would be handy on all the various Wild Game Production podcasts, and I'm sure a lot of people might want to take a peek at your guys' list of favorite RPG web links. Keep up the great work and see at least half of you at the next Saturday game. <laughs> oh, thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim. Fingers crossed. <sighs> yeah, I, I got to admit, you know, I, I don't even listen to the first, say, five or six episodes of Save or Die because, you know, as I've said before, I had no idea what I was doing. I'd never been involved in any kind of a podcast or just anything that had to do with recording. And so, you know, people say I don't talk much now, but I feel like I really did not say much in the beginning and I felt awkward and, you know, just I don't like to listen to myself those first few episodes. I just feel like, uh, uh. So, <laughs> but I do think that, you know, at least I've gotten better doing the show as time has gone on. And so I appreciate the fact that you appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> that was back in oh, the I old think- days. Nowadays, you guys just invite somebody on as a guest and then snap the cuffs around their ankles. And then, <laughs> then you're stuck being a co-host. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> John yeah. Peterson, you're next. That's right. You better watch out. <laughs> People keep telling us we need to make him a regular host. Yeah. Well, there's an awkward moment as we all thought, would I give up my seat for John? No. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so as we all wonder no. which one of us is going to be gotten rid of. Yes, who would have to leave? And I'm thinking it would probably have to be me. <laughs> no, no. It'd probably be me or Jim before it would be you. No, no, no. Everyone likes Jim's presence too much. He, no. That's true. It's it's probably, if, this was, if this was a cartoon, it was three head panels of each of us thinking the exact same thing. Oh, God, mm-hmm. get, they're going to get rid of me. They're going to get rid of me. <laughs> Kill one, then we all move up in rank. Well, ha, ha. But, well thanks, Tim. As far as for an actual page with web, web locations on it, uh, you'll have to talk to our webmaster. Oh, no. That's but, good. We have, but we have passed your suggestion along, and it may or may not be implemented. <laughs> yeah. Write our executive producer, and then he'll write me, and I might as well just go ahead and do it. <laughs> I know where it's going to end up. I, I mean, that would be – I mean, a blog roll, uh, a collected link page, it takes some work, but uh, it's perfectly appropriate, and we could build that into the site. Yeah. <laughs> or I wonder if it would be easier if we just set up a blog at, say, blogspot.com or something, and it's only there just to – for us to add – uh, links to that we refer to in the show notes? Well, we talk about it off air, but if, if I went back okay. through the last 20 thir- or so episodes and collected all those links, they would at least be somewhere. I mean, it won't, it won't, if you don't want to look at it, you don't click on that link on the page. Yeah, yeah. So even sure if that's enough. just one service we render for an individual listener, that's the kind of podcast we run. That's right. That's how we roll or something like that. Something. In, in all so. my spare time, I'll get that done. <laughs> Copious amounts of spare time. Yes, in between doing this podcast, doing the Spellburn podcast, writing your own stuff, doing the web comic, and of course you have a job apart from gaming-related stuff as well. You've got plenty of time. <laughs> I, start, I started calling the day job the, the Daily Bugle. Now, this is where I show up <laughs> to pay the bills. <laughs> Okie dokie. Well, our next letter is from Pete Spahn, 
And he, hey! he, starts, he starts out with, holy cow, guys and gal. I just wanted to say a huge thank you for taking the time to do such a thorough review. A little history. The Chronicles of Amherth started as my own campaign world from Redbox D&D through 2nd Edition. I've been running it off and on for over 20 years. It was heavily inspired by Mistara, with a bit of Ravenloft and Blackmore thrown in on the side. Preach it, I'm brother. Still... <laughs> I can see that. I'm still running this with my group two to three times a month. When I decided to publish it, my goal was to present it as a fantasy setting that was easy for pick-up-and-play games, as well as long-term campaigns. In 2006, Brett Bernstein of... Is it Pressis? P-R-E-C-I-S? I'm not sure how you would pronounce that. Pressis? Yeah. Intermedia Games was looking for a vanilla fantasy setting for his Iron Gauntlets RPG. Pig? To <laughs> Together, we stripped out a lot of the sci fantasy tech and low magic elements and turned it into a more high fantasy setting. Years later, I discovered the publisher Friendly Wonder, that is Labyrinth Lord, and decided to release Amherth under the system it was originally designed for, adding back all the elements that were taken out. The Duchy of Valnwall was already presented in the LL Core rulebook, so all I did was reskin my own kingdom of Arlen to match it. This way, people who had already started playing in the Duchy would not have to change their game much. On the setting quirks, demi humans are rare, but they're not completely unheard of. Think of them more like unwelcome foreigners. I envision their appearance in a human community, similar to the appearance of a Muslim in full garb walking around medieval London. He's going to get some stares and more than a bit of prejudice, but he's not necessarily going to be run out of town on sight. So, Morgan Freeman. (laughs) (laughs) I'm glad you all picked up on the megalomaniacal nature of Emperor Zan. I certainly do have an answer for why he keeps coming back in my games but I'd rather save it for the guidebook to the Empire of Zan, along with several alternative reasons he keeps getting resurrected for those who don't like my explanation. It does not have a table of contents, but it is fully bookmarked for people who are viewing it on their browsers. I never gave much thought to a TOC, if there's a good index, but I will make sure to include one in future editions. For us old people. (laughs) <laughs> but don't use those newfangledy book bookie mark things. <laughs> eh, those PDFs. That's a fad. <laughs> it's a fad. It's going away. That's like funny. CDs. I know I'm getting old because uh, Marcos was running DCC and he could find a rule on his iPad PDF copy in the rule book faster than I could thumb to it. And I'm just like, okay, I just have to accept it. I've gotten old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, talking about that the guy who wrote in last tim he's like i he from what i heard he got rid of virtually all his uh hardback 2e stuff he references everything on his pda it's like wow mm. I, i'm old <laughs> these youngins mm-hmm. uh, anyway pete goes on to say the cover could certainly be improved on i wanted it to stand out among the modules with its own trade dress but it ended up looking too bland and generic, as you mentioned. I plan to release a hardcover version in the future with more content and a better cover. I'm even considering a combined Amherth plus guidebook to the Duchy of Valnwall release to give those who want more crunch a quick place to start. Speaking of that, the guidebook to the Duchy of Valnwall is still very much a work in progress. Because of real-life constraints on my writing time, I've decided to release it in pieces as I finish one part or another. Ghoul Keep and the Ghoul Lands was the first release. The next will be the capital, City of Dolmve. This city will be almost 100% open content, meaning other publishers are welcome to take the maps and locations and create their own adventures in the city. Hmm. Lastly, I'll probably release the overview of the duchy simultaneously with the Great Valnwall Mega Dungeon. As always, I will try to leave things as open as possible. Ghoul Keep and the Ghoul Lands was sort of a template for how the duchy of Valnwall overview will be presented, 
people, culture, major cities, NPCs, factions, new monsters, etc. I'm still writing adventures when I can, in addition to compiling articles for the Brave the Labyrinth quarterly fanzine. Anyway, thanks again for all the great comments and feedback. Thanks, Peter. Wow. Yeah, I kind of... I kind of know what he somebody. means. About, huh? I've just never liked somebody I haven't met yet so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was pretty. I was interested in his explanation about the Iron Gauntlets RPG because I remember seeing elsewhere on one of the Facebook gaming pages that there had been an Am a Chronicles of Amherst put out for Iron Gauntlets. And it's like, huh, that's not the one we just reviewed. It's like, okay, so there was Iron Gauntlet's version first, and now this one. I think you can still get all that stuff, because if you go to Drive Through RPG and put in Chronicles of Amherth, A-M-H-E-R-T-H, um, all kinds of stuff mm-hmm. pops up besides what we reviewed. Okay. I guess most of the other stuff is probably for the Iron Gauntlet's game, then. I, I don't know, but could be. Okay. But no, I... I think that's a great idea as far as, you know, publishing your own home campaign and making the the capital 100% open contents a really good idea because it, it encourages people to what amounts to put out adventures for your campaign setting. That's the way And of course, it. yeah, and of course there'll be stuff he particularly doesn't, you know, think works with his view of the game, but he can just ignore them like any DM. So cool. And we'll be reviewing Ghoul Lands coming up in the next episode or two. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to taking a gander at that. And that leads us into our next email from Vile Traveler. VT. Vile writes, what ho? A fine topic for the airwaves, dear DMs. Especially when all of you clearly have different feelings about the matter of science fiction in your fantasy. (laughs) Although clearly it's a capital idea when even DM Glenn admits it works. Grumble, sometimes, like in Carcosa. (laughs) Reluctantly, kicking and screaming all the way. (laughs) I've never really thought about it before. But science fiction has pretty much always been present in my fantasy gaming experience. The first time was probably when we came across a box of pineapple grenades and grease guns in an orc lair. Our magic user thought the SMGs were great, although he couldn't hit anything with them. In fact, now I mention them, that party found their way into the far future, where they crossed the desert and found themselves in an adobe starport where they helped a scoundrel steal back his ship from a customs pound. Where you'll never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy? Mm. (laughs) (laughs) I've had a recurring robotic golem-like creature in Glorantha, a scout crashing his Type S scout-slash-courier on a fantasy world where he couldn't breathe the air, so he had to spend the rest of his career in an environment suit. And the funny thing is, we never thought it was funny or gonzo at the time. I've always been a relatively serious referee and player, and I've never done this sort of stuff tongue-in-cheek. Which yeah, gets... Gl- hmm? Sorry, but just to clarify, I think Glorantha is the campaign world for RuneQuest, isn't it? Well, you got um, I don't know. Yeah, the Chaosium fantasy game. But I was anyways, say, I, I personally never played RuneQuest, so okay. I, I couldn't tell you. Um, Anyway, he goes on to say, which gets back to the chocolate and peanuts thing you were talking about. What is it with Americans and peanuts, anyway? (laughs) I know people... hmm? Humph. Humph. (laughs) Well, they eat kidney pie in England, so they're... (laughs) Grump, grump. (laughs) I know people on both sides of the fence come up with arguments for or against lasers and lizard men... But to me, it all boils down to one thing. Either you dig this sort of thing, or you can't get into it. I've never tried to analyze it until this show. Thanks. But now that I think about it, I can clearly see why people would say science fiction in your dungeon is silly. But it just never felt that way to me in play. Thanks for another spiffing episode, DMs, and mind the oranges. Vile Traveler, The Blue Holm Project. Just waiting for the next attack of the clones. <laughs> Send us a copy. That's right. I think this is probably a good time to mention. 
all of the things that we review on the show, we have virtually no budget here at Save or Die, and people send them to us gratis, or it's something that all of us just happen to have already purchased a copy of ourselves, and so we can all review it. Um, we don't deliberately, you know, ignore certain releases. It's just that we don't have access to them. So if you would like us to review an old school adventure or setting or something that you have just put out, you know, please feel free to send us a PDF version of it that we can share amongst ourselves and we'll read it and we would be happy to review. <laughs> Save or die podcast at gmail.com. So just so you, anyone who may be thinking we're giving Pete Spawn preferential treatment. <laughs> he sends us his stuff. <laughs> it's true. Which works out because then I went around and turned around and bought it in print anyway. That, yeah. <laughs> and, so there I, you go. and I hand tinted my own cover, so my cover looks better. Ooh. <laughs> but yeah, going off of something Traveler was saying is I think we covered a little bit in the last episode that you know, at least in the 70s, 60s and 70s, having technology showing up in a fantasy world wasn't that quote-unquote gonzo, really. We didn't even have that many modules when I first started, and we would just take, but the ones we had had some of that stuff in it, and uh, it was certainly in Blackmore, so we just took our lead, and plus we were teenagers. Uh, so we grabbed anything we liked from anything we liked. I mean, do you guys remember an old DC comic called The Warlord? Mike yeah, yeah. Which was completely different from John Carter. <laughs> very Edgar Rice of Burroughs, very Pellucidar setting. And, you know, <laughs> that's the way my brother ran his campaign. We turn a corner one day, and here's a ranger who's got a little automatic pistol, and next thing we figure out, we're, you know, Tra Travis Morgan is our new NPC. And it was, we just roll with it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's It wasn't quite so stratified. I'm not sure how that happened. Somewhere in the 80s, uh, High fantasy, I guess, became a little more – there were certain tropes that were expected and you didn't you know, valid, you know, vary from those particular ideas. I don't yeah. know why. but And, and, and it, I'll play whatever. If I'm sitting down to play with you guys as a group and it's very straight up pure you know, medieval European fantasy, I'm fine with that. I have fun with that too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I – I, I can see where when if you started in the 70s, it probably doesn't bug you that much. Um, pity Crispy isn't on the show anymore. We could ask him as a youngin how he feels about it, having joined the game late, comparatively. I mean, to be perfectly honest, as soon as a character popped up in Phineas Fingers, who was a wizard who had a, a, a what do you have, the wand of uh, magic fireballs. Wand of magic missiles. Yeah, <laughs> and it's an automatic <laughs> weapon. I'm like, I want that. It's a, yeah, Tommy Gun. Yeah, that, that was cool. Or that Sturmger Schultz and Sorcery, you know, help the players on either side didn't even know they were doing a crossover. They were to, on one side, they're told, okay, it's going to be a fantasy, you know, chainmail game. And the other side's being told, no, nah, it's going to be tactics, World War II minis. And then they get to the table and surprised. <laughs> I think every now and then that really keeps players on their toes and is invaluable when it comes to the inevitable planar travel. Yeah, sooner or later. You want you run into that, especially at higher levels. Mm -hmm. Like those modules that say have a trap or an adventure that says it will knock your players into another plane, and that's all it says. And you got oh crap, what oh, plane? What now? I gotta come up. Now with I gotta something. come up with a plane. Yeah. <laughs> well, first edition A D and Taco. I mean, it's right there in the DMG guide. <laughs> you know, alternate prime material planes are on the chart, and here's how you do that: send them to Boot Hill, send them to Gamma World. Gamma World, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Gamora was a big place we looted a lot from in, back in the day. But anyway, well, thanks for the email, Traveler. And our next one is from D.A. Hill, otherwise known as D.A. Mothshade. Moth! And he writes, hello all, D.A. Mothshade here. Let me get a few quick things out of the way first. One. Thank you for having Jim Wampler as a regular on the show. He is a class act and represents my own views and thoughts well. 
I feel better connected to the show through his presence. Long may you wave, Jim. And Marshade, your check's already in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> this time it should even go through. <laughs> Number two. I missed Liz's input a little in this episode. Sounded like an awful lot of silence from her mic, and that is a bit of a loss in my opinion. Number three. Glenn and I seem to come from very different ends of the gaming spectrum, but I do enjoy his views and opinions very much. He keeps me thinking and questioning. Keep firing away, Glenn. And number four. I also share a lot of Mike's preferences regarding D&D and the flavor of the game. I appreciate his position of leadership in the group and all the work he obviously puts into this game we all love so much. Okay. Thank you. (laughs) Okay. Thank you all for this episode. It is a topic I often enjoy exploring and almost always takes me back to my own gaming roots. I've always found a little sci-fi or pseudoscience in the fantasy milieu to be a welcome dash of spice. It tends to keep players guessing and helps amp up the excitement or mystery of even the most pedestrian encounter a little more. Personally, and I know I've said this before, I've always taken my cues in this area from Carl Edward Wagner's Kane stories, as well as a bit of Blackmore. <sighs> Yay, Kane. <laughs> yeah. When I, I, when I get off my current zombie reading kick, I really need to pick up those novels. This has not happened in over a year, Mike. It could happen. <laughs> Mike has been reading zombie stories for, what, Two years now? Hey, I break with occasional fantasy or or historical stuff. Mm-hmm. It's not solid zombie novels. Are you novels. getting ready to write a zombie game? <laughs> uh, well, depending on how, what Victorious does, maybe. I've, I, I've already pitched the idea to, to Troll Lord of a zombie survival horror game, but let's, let's see what happens with Victorious first. But seriously, Mike is a zombie nut. <laughs> I love him anyway, but he's got zombies, dare I say, on the brain forever now. (laughs) Brains. So, yeah, I'm sure one day he will get to the Kane stories. It may be another year from now, but... (laughs) Anyway. Anyway. (laughs) I love the idea of ancient alien civilizations that have fallen into decay and legend but left remnants of their creations for other, less advanced individuals to unearth and abuse. (laughs) (laughs) I like to see players becoming their own worst enemies with powers they barely understand or control. Just Just like half the episodes of Thundar the Barbarian, yeah. That might be why I enjoy Kane so much. His ambition and hubris often outstrip his resources and patience. I will say that I often find the occasional comparison between our world and the medieval fantasy world of the past kind of amusing, as if the average D&D world is merely Earth and medieval times, but with working magic and countless mythical monsters. I I got something to say on that later, but (laughs) go ahead. I've rarely participated in a campaign where medieval or Dark Age realism prevailed with or without widespread and convenient magic. When magic is real and clerics wield the might of active gods, technology is often factored in through other mediums. Disease becomes less widespread, water is cleaner, continual light turns night into day, and crystal balls allow video chat anywhere you have another crystal ball. Then it is all about flavor. Personally, I can't compare the D&D setting with feudal Europe, for example. Not clearly. While I prefer that flavor, I am not quite as interested in the true conditions or socioeconomic factors for my own game. The idea of fantasy anachronism appeals strongly to me. Yep. Do you go out of your way to keep more modern conveniences from your game, even with the presence of magic, divine interventions, and the possibility of advanced alchemy. No continual light street lamps. No otyugs taking care of municipal waste. Or gelatinous cubes. (laughs) No emergency crystal ball early warning systems. 
Are these details considered less than medieval and therefore unwelcome? Would the populace not tend to think along these lines with the resources at hand? If magic is so reliable, wouldn't it eventually become similar to technology? Would those with the means not exploit it for their own convenience and advancement? How could we say no? Or so I wonder from time to time. Thank you for another great episode. I'd like to cast my vote for a sequel at your earliest convenience. I feel there was much more to explore. Take care, DM Mothshade. Thank you for that excellent email, Soul Brother. Yeah. <laughs> Just like going, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. When we were kids, uh, we just, you know, did everything he talked about. By the time my brother's universe was a couple years old, we were abusing the magic system and turning it basically into 20th century America. We were conquering a continent, you know, a state at a time to spread democracy and all kinds of magic, you know, sort of stuff going on. We built a flying ship, you know, for for a, a fireball platform. We did all kind, all the kinds of that stuff. Now that really you. You spread democracy? Yeah, we, we were spreading democracy. Never mind, I can't say that. I don't want to get any more trouble on the forums. That's what we told ourselves. We had, we had, a, we had an interesting interpretation of lawful good. But uh, um, my perhaps was, it's like uh, Putin's Russia managed democracy? Yeah, I, I don't want to focus on that. The point I'm trying to make is <laughs> now that I'm an, a more mature, older gamer, I find myself uh, favoring – the, the mystery of the game, like was mentioned in the email, keeping things mysterious and, and a little dangerous because that's a more enjoyable game. And uh, so I'm today in favor of, you know, low magic, everything super rare settings. Uh, in Dungeon Crawl Classics, the, it's a practically a barter economy. The game I'm writing, I stuck them in the Neolithic Age. They can't even forge metal weapons. You know, so you find a bottle cap. That's an art. You know, that's something great. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> You know, enough of those, you could leather them together into some armor. Mm. So I've changed views from a younger person to now. Well, I think at least when I was gaming as a teenager, um, the may, I, maybe it was different for you, Jim, maybe it wasn't. Um, the idea is always more, bigger, better. You know, what can I, not exactly min-maxing, but, you know, always going for the bigger, more powerful item or spell or whatever, and you know, the, the plausibility or campaign worthiness of it was always kind of secondary. I, well, I think I mentioned in an earlier episode, in my brother's campaign, it actually reached a point where you were not allowed to cast a wish spell. When we got high enough level that some of us had wish, you weren't allowed to cast limited wish or wish in a mass uh, combat because there was an arms treaty agreement amongst all the nations not to do that because there had been wish wars, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> Our middle school campaign reached a point to where I had a 50th level wizard living on the moon <laughs> with, with a huge, I kid you not, projection fireball cannon aimed at Greyhawk. Wow. Sir, that I could just take out cities with. That is a 12 pack of awesome sauce that you will even admit to that in public. <laughs> it was at that point we thought maybe we need to start another campaign. <laughs> Dare I ask what? alignment you were playing why the the standard of our entire group for all of middle school chaotic neutral oh i, I was gonna go with lunar good <laughs> <laughs> ah well do you want to say anything about the letter liz or um well i i do want to thank moth for letting me know that my presence was missed last time I... he's far from the only one too i've heard it on the forums well Thank you, everyone. I, I appreciate that. I, a lot of times I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm here mostly as the token girl. And, you know, maybe that's just me being, you know, I don't know. But Silly. sometimes I just, I just wonder, you know, are there really that many people who are interested in what I have to say about you know, the game, or is it just, oh, she's the girl on the show, so it's it's a viewpoint from the opposite sex. You know, it's like, I, I don't really feel like I have a particularly feminine view of stuff, but anyway. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> now that I've gamed with you, I, I'm never going to cross you. 
<laughs> but so, so much for being feminine. <laughs> She'll cut you. Cut you bad. Well, no, I'm glad Moss Shade wrote that in because I, I had a fit like the next day with Mike. <laughs> like, come on. It's we, true. We, we can't have that happen again. It's true. He sent me a private email saying, yeah, look, we got to do something about this. Well, through no fault of any of the rest of you, but it's – I don't – put myself out there as much and maybe that is the the female thing because i have certainly read that women are less likely to you know just butt into a conversation than a guy is to you know put their point of view across while others are talking and you got three butts here and you know so i've it's very easy for you know others to just start keep talking and if i don't feel like there's a big enough opening for me to just leap in a lot of times I'll just sit back and I won't say anything and that's more my fault than anyone else's fault I probably ought to just kick people in the shins physically or metaphysically (laughs) it's like hey I'm talking here (laughs) well no I I I do think we have some responsibility for it because it's a very uh, common male response when you disagree about something to assert your authority. And when three of us get going at it at the same time, I mean. Yeah. And as noted by many of our fans in the last episode, we already spent a whole lot of time on the emails. And I was trying to keep it the show from becoming a three or four hour monster. So I, I kind of rushed through probably more than I should have. So we're going to try to get our discussions. I mean, I don't want us to get too formal, you know, like Robert's Rules of Order or anything. But but I think we need to give Liz a little more time to give an opinion. I can tell you when I was not on the show and just a listener, uh, you were what I listened to the show for most. How's that? Um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> because well, no, I seriously, I mean, it's- because I liked Holmes, a eh, Holmes OD and D. Well, no, I forgive you for that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's well, not like well, I, you I, play I, a lot of talk. Well, I forgive anything. you for not caring for Holmes OD&D. Then. Oh, no, I, lo- I love it, but I want to I ask a question about Holmes D&D back to the last email. I've been, I've been saving this the whole time uh, because here's a quick measure of what that guy wrote about. In, in Port Town, in your universe, your Holmes universe, Liz, are there magic shops? Um. Technically, there probably ought to be, um, but I tend to run a pretty low magic campaign now myself. Um, when I first started, that was not the case, and I let everybody have you know, at least a single plus one weapon or some kind of magic armor or whatever to start with, and part of that was because just getting into this game, and it was all so new and amazing to me, the very idea of having magic items to use was part of the cool factor for Mm -hmm. me and my friends. So I don't think any of us felt at the time that we were, you know, power gaming. We just wanted to have a magic sword. You know, I want a magic sword, you know, because it's cool to have one. And so I, magic was a lot more prevalent then. And, you you found it a lot more often when I first started running games, but nowadays, yeah, you you don't you don't have a magic shop that you can just go to and and buy stuff. You have to yeah. find it. Because <laughs> well, that I was interested in your answer, and there's a bifurcation there between two different things that we talked about interactively, which is it, your campaign setting and playstyle per preferences which you can't argue you you and your group if they like high fantasy if they like low fantasy if they like a mix of sci-fi and fantasy and that's what they like you can't argue that everybody has their preference go have fun but you can argue that being able to walk into a store and buy a plus two sword is not a good game yeah Um, supernatural walmart yeah exactly and we did that when we were young we because we just didn't know any Mm -hmm. better okay can i give my opinion no (laughs) (laughs) oh all right that's the other problem i have it's like whenever i get everybody to be quiet and say what do you think liz and it i feel really dumb when you go i don't have an opinion 
<laughs> so anyway, he's right. Um, as some people may know, uh, my first master's degree was in medieval European history. And it always bugged me about how D&D, any world, whether it's Forgotten Realms, I, which I think is really bad about it, but Greyhawk or Bastara or whatnot, never really felt medieval, at least not to what I had read. And he's right. The stereotypical D&D village is set up more like a small American town in funny hats. It's, you know, you've got stores, you've got people that live there, you've got the mayor. You almost never see a liege lord. Or if you do, he's some prissy idiot that just comes into the pub and beats up uh, visitors, you know, that sort of thing. It's part of the tourist experience. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Hi, I'm here to give you your plot hook and be an asshole. <laughs> exactly. Hooray! Exactly. He's either there to give you a plot hook or to give you trouble, you know, one way or the other. Um, there's no, you know, local nobles justice. There's no, and as far as talking about the barter economy, um, yeah, I mean, most of feudal, especially dark age Europe, I, the whole idea of actually having coin was pretty astounding of any metal. That's why everything was done. You know, you swore fealty and in return, you get this land and these villages, which will be enough to maintain you as a fighting man. To serve your liege lord or your king, because I don't have gold to just shovel out to you as payment. And yeah, most fantasy D and D S type worlds are not like that. Now that being said, I think unless you're dealing with a whole bunch of brand new people, you have to make a certain amount of ex accepting of that sort of setup because that's what most people expect out of a D and D world, even if they're running. You know, you're running your own campaign world and not any of the published ones. Well, yeah, um, see, that's that's the that's the cognitive thing people get caught up in. They want to argue the the preferences when okay, you're arguing realism in a game with fireballs and dragons that can't possibly fly in real physics. You know, so uh, right. it's not but, about that. You and you're arguing about something that doesn't exist. It is about campaign verisimilitude. Are things consistent? Ooh, I was just gonna gonna mention that bit of high guy My yes, single favorite, my single favorite word in the entire English language. You know, are things consistent? Do they make sense? You know, what you can do along any spectrum we've talked about: high, low, magic, sci-fi, whatever you want. As long as it's consistent and it it makes sense, and it's no, never mind. I made my point. Yeah, and. That's why in my campaign worlds, while I really wish I could get PC magic users to experiment in making new and different spells, I am not a big fan of letting PCs make magic items. Unless it's like low-level stuff like, you know, cure potions or that sort of thing. I tend to prefer the idea that magic items, especially the more powerful ones, are from an earlier age – and you don't just make them at home. You've got to go out and find them. They're the remnants of an earlier, more powerful civilization. That way you don't run into the argument of why don't they have continual light spells on every you know, street corner. Da, 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 da. Um, I also tend to keep my magic users in my campaign world as part of a guild. And if you know anything about medieval guilds, they didn't share their secrets with anybody. And... Sure, they may, you know, nicen up their own homes and everything, but they're going to pay, cause nobles or whatever to pay through the nose, even to just get a private, you know, desk lamp continual light spell. You know, they're never going to just lay them out for a whole city because in that case, it, everybody will just <laughs> go down the corner and steal a continual light stone out of the street lamp and you now have eternal light basically for your home. You know, they're not going to do that. I have to give my younger brother Scott credit. I mean, when he ran his old AD&D universe, he was old school back when it was just school. I would always come up with great ideas for manufacturing mag magic items, and he would let me do it, and then I would immediately lose control of the item, and there would be our next campaign year's worth of adventures, <laughs> chasing that thing down and trying to get it back. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that sort of thing works. And it's like a lot of things in D&D, &D, uh, any version of D&D. &D. 
it, it's it's very easy for a DM to lose control of their campaign, but if they're willing to put their foot down, it's very easy to return control too. But again, you have to meet some of your players' expectations. Otherwise, they'll just leave and you'll be a DM without a game. So, you know, what's the point of that? Yeah, Tim Cass said something to that effect on Facebook this past week, uh, and he said it before. Like, my thing is always, if you're having fun, you're doing it right. But Tim adds, are your players coming back? Because if, if you're having fun and your players keep showing up, then you're all right. Yeah. Uh, one of my former roommates at one time I heard was grousing to a bunch of the players in my game about how, you know, Mike just doesn't follow all the rules he just throws them out and plays his own little game. <laughs> and, I remember that. How'd yeah, that work out for and, the grouser? And my com- comment was, well, everybody's coming back to my game. How many people do you have in your game? Oh, yeah, nobody. In fact, he was trying to get me to turn over my game for a session or two to let him run. And like, uh, no. Yeah, I seem to and all my players were going. Yeah, we were all don't saying, care. "Don't, don't let him." <laughs> so, yeah, as long as your players are coming back, then you're probably doing something right. So anyway, thanks for that, Ma Shade. Yes, indeed. Hope we've given you all the answer you were hoping for. He probably still wants a sequel. Yeah, a sequel sci-fi episode. We gotta revisit that sometime in the future. And maybe not spend the first hour of it doing emails. Uh, maybe, yeah. And speaking of, this is our our final bit of mail in the mailbag from Alistair Scarlet, otherwise known as Naylan on Dragon's Foot. Naylan! And Woo-hoo. he writes, Hi Mike, Liz, Glenn, et al. <laughs> right. Hi, I'm you want et al, Jim? I got et al. <laughs> No, et al. You're al. DM al now. <laughs> you can call him al. That's right. <laughs> anyway. Call me Betty. He wants to know, whatever happened to the reviews of the X series modules? I remember you reviewing the B series up to B10, which got something of a dismissive review, if I remember correctly. Actually, we, we ran through all the Bs. Right through King's Harvest and Queen's Festival. But anyway. Anyway, the next logical step was to move on to X1, but I don't remember it happening. There was also talk of play podcasts. Still listening to the podcasts and still enjoying them. Keep up the good work. Maybe one day I will pluck up the courage to record a DM experience of running B10 for you. Cheers, Alistair. Do it. Good for our basic impressions, please. This um, live play podcast thing just won't die, will it? No, we, no. We might have to actually do one just so people can hear it and then go, okay, we were wrong, please And stop. then understand why <laughs> they shouldn't want well, to hear it. <laughs> well, right, because we even talked about it in uh, Angry Monk's game, and that would have been two hours of us, you know, slumming through bars in town trying to find yeah. the, the thing and spending well, – we spent two hours getting to the front door of the dungeon. <laughs> and Doc Mindwipe trying to sneak – use his thief skills to sneak up behind you and tickle you. Or hey, so- yeah, I'm, I, I'm primarily worried about my own tendency to cuss like a drunk sailor during gameplay, <laughs> which I won't beep, be able beep, to do beep, on air. Beep, but, I mean, I'm not sure Doc Mindwipe is appropriate for public display. <laughs> <laughs> No offense, Doc. I love you. I love gaming with you, but... Not safe for work. <laughs> Maybe we could just put a, a warning. <laughs> uh, so, I don't but, know. Yeah, why, why, why didn't we do any reviews well, of X? We, that's a good we started, or Vince and the others started, I think they got to X3 or X4, but that was when we were kind of having some trouble and we were really sporadic on the show. And it was mostly Vince, Glenn, and Crispy. And maybe Julie. I I don't know if it just kind of petered out or if we it, it, they decided to stop. It is something we ought to look back into. Then I suppose we could just we could either go back and see where they stopped or be lazy and just start off with X One Isle of Dread again and start going through the list. Well, it would all be new to me, so starting with X One would be fine. Huh? Write in and tell us what you think. 
should we start over doing the X series? Severedivepodcast at gmail.com. Well, I think that's it. That's the mailbag is empty. It Holy is empty. Except for, the, except for the mail that Montana sent us after I collated all of the emails. And so I could grab that real quick and then go, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> See, That'll learn know, him. Right before we were recording, you put it on Facebook that we were doing an email episode, didn't you? I did. And you and got then an Montana email out of it. Says, I just sent you an email. Like, <laughs> well, too bad. <laughs> It'll have to wait for 83. <laughs> Maybe one of these days, instead of a live play podcast, we could figure out how to do a live show and take calls. I'm sure there's an internet way to rig that. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I've listened to other podcasts yeah, where they've done that. Here. Okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> that one won't be safe for work either, I'm guessing. But <laughs> Well, maybe next year's North Texas we could do something like that. Oh, that would be you know, awesome. Set up a table or something. Huh? We got time. How would we do that? I mean, How would we do it? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, we wouldn't do it through the entire con. Yeah, here's 37 hours of us sitting yeah, around BSing. We yeah. No. We couldn't do it at the con. We'd have to get up in a room because that place was loud. That's true. That's true. Even if they gave us a table, it would be – I mean, they are going to get a new venue, but still. Hmm. Well, we can talk about it. Yeah, we can talk about it. We'll figure something out. Anything else we want to chat about? Well. And so the email baggins bagend bag is done for another – well, except for Montana's. It's not Yay. my bag, baby. That's right. He'll have to wait till episode 83. So we'll teeter on down the road once again. How are you heading down the road, Liz? I'm heading down the road on that really cool sounding mule that you were talking about at the beginning of the episode. My real life Galaxy Rangers horse. <laughs> Rangers, let's ride. And Jim? Uh, I'm going to go down to the magic store and just wipe them out of potions and scrolls. <laughs> Darn, you took mine. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, I'm heading down the road looking at the catalog from the magical Walmart that just opened up down the street. <laughs> <laughs> See, evil DM minds think alike, Mike. Wahaha. And no refunds. <laughs> Take care, everyone, and we'll see you in episode 83. See ya. Bye-bye. Free arc. The Save or Die podcast is a production of Wild Games Productions in association with d20radio.com. The Save or Die theme music was provided by the band Mississippi Bones. You can find them at mississippibones.bandcamp.com. Promotional consideration for the Save or Die podcast was provided by Wizards Mart, making the world safe for democracy, one magic user at a time. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time on Save or Die! <laughs>